13, The Origin of Species. So what is a species really? How do we define it? Darwin was eager to explore landforms that newly emerged from the sea when he came to the Galapagos Islands. He noted that these volcanic islands, despite the fact that they were young, were teeming with plants and animals found nowhere else in the world. He realized that these new species, like the islands, were relatively new. Microevolution is the change in the gene pool of a population from one generation to the next generation. Speciation is the process where one species splits into two or more species. And each time that happens, the diversity of life will increase. Over the course of three and a half billion years, an ancestral species first gave rise to two or more different species, which then branched to new lineages and branched again and again until we arrive at the millions of species that live or once lived on Earth. The word species is from the Latin for kind or appearance. So the basic idea of species as a distinct life form seems obvious. Devising a more formal definition is not easy and it does raise some questions. In many cases, the difference between two species are very clear, but in other cases, the differences between them are not so clear. For example, here, very little difference that's noticeable. How similar are members of the same species? The individuals of many species exhibit fairly limited variation in physical appearance. Certain other species, like ours, are extremely varied. The biological species concept defines a species as a group of populations whose members have the potential to interbreed in nature and, it's important, this part's important, they have to be able to produce fertile offspring. So the offspring themselves need to be able to reproduce. Thus, members of a biological species are united by being reproductively compatible, at least potentially. Reproductive isolation will prevent genetic exchange and maintain a boundary between species. But there are some pairs of species that do occasionally interbreed. The resulting offspring are called hybrids. An example is the grizzly bear and the polar bear, whose hybrid offspring have been called growler bears. There are some other instances in which applying the biological species concept can be problematic. There's no way to determine whether organisms that are now known only through fossils, whether or not they were once able to interbreed. Reproductive isolation does not apply to prokaryotes or other organisms that rep reproduce only asexually. So alternate species concepts can also be useful. The morphological species concept classifies organisms based on their observable physical traits, so what we can actually observe, and can be applied to asexual organisms and fossils. However, there is some subjectivity to this in deciding which traits to use. The ecological species concept defines a species by its ecological niche and focuses on adaptations that are unique to particular roles in a biological community. So for example, two species may be similar in appearance, but you can tell them apart based on what they eat, the depth of water they're usually found in, for example. The phylogenetic species concept defines a species as the smallest group of individuals that share a common ancestor and thus form one branch of the tree of life. Biologists can trace the phylogenetic history of a species by comparing its morphology, so its observable physical traits, 
the DNA sequences, or biochemical pathways. Agreeing on the amount of difference required to establish separate species still remains a challenge. Reproductive barriers can keep species separate. Reproductive barriers will serve to isolate the gene pools of species and prevent interbreeding. Depending on whether they function before or after the zygotes form, the zygote being a fertilized egg um, a, or a pre-embryo, reproductive barriers are characterized as either pre-zygotic or post-zygotic. So let's start with the pre-zygotic barriers, of which there are five. These are going to prevent mating to start with, so no mating can occur between species, no fertilization possible. And the five options for this, or the five types, we have one, habitat isolation. So if they live in different places, there's a lack of opportunity for the mates to even get together. In temporal isolation, there is breeding at different seasons or times, which keeps them separated. So here's some examples. We've got habitat isolation between these snakes. So one is clearly um, located in the water and one is on land. So it's going to be really hard for those two to encounter one another. Temporal isolation, breeding at different times or seasons. So the eastern spotted skunk breeds in late winter and the western breeds in the fall. We also have behavioral isolation, where there is a failure to send or receive appropriate signals from the mate. In mechanical isolation, there is physical incompatibility of the reproductive parts. Doesn't work. In gametic isolation, there is a molecular incompatibility of eggs and sperm, or pollen and stigma. So here's a behavioral isolation example. The blue-footed booby, which we talked about before, on the left, that particular species performs an elaborate courtship dance, which is super cute. And then the mast booby on the right performs a different courtship ritual. Mechanical isolation where there is physical incompatibility of reproductive parts. So the heliconia Poganatha is pollinated by hummingbirds with long, curved bills, whereas the Heliconia latispatha is pollinated by hummingbirds with short, straight bills. Gametic isolation is the molecular incompatibility of eggs and sperm, or pollen and stigma. So, in other words, the eggs and sperm will not unite, will not fit. There are three types of post-zygotic barriers that operate after hybrid zygotes have formed. So after mating has occurred, when there is an offspring on the way, what can prevent further, or what can, what can give us further barriers against those two species mating? So post-zygotic, after mating. So there are three options here, three types. We have reduced hybrid viability, where the interaction of the parental genes will impair the hybrid's development or survival. So the hybrid will be weaker, will not necessarily develop as strongly or survive as long. In reduced hybrid fertility, the hybrids are strong, but they can't produce viable offspring. In hybrid breakdown, the hybrids are viable and fertile, but their offspring are feeble or sterile. Reduced hybrid viability, where the hybrid development or survival is impaired by parental genes. Um, an example here, some salamander species can hybridize, but their offspring don't develop fully or are frail and won't necessarily survive long enough to reproduce. Reduced hybrid fertility, this is a common one, the hybrids are strong and vigorous, but they cannot produce viable offspring. A mule is the example here. It's the hybrid offspring of a horse and a donkey. Hybrid breakdown, where viable and fertile, and fertile hybrids with feeble 
or sterile offspring. So the rice hybrids on the left and right are fertile, but plants of the next generation, these guys in the middle, are sterile. Mechanisms of speciation. A key event in the origin of a new species is the separation of a population from other populations in the same group or same species. When the gene pool is isolated, the splinter population can follow its own evolutionary course. The changes in allele frequencies caused by natural selection, genetic drift, and mutation will not be diluted by alleles entering from other populations, also known as gene flow. In allopatric speciation, the initial block to gene flow can come from a geographic barrier that isolates a population. So some of these processes that can actually isolate populations are a mountain range can emerge and split a population of organisms. A large lake can subside until there are several smaller lakes isolating fish populations. Continents themselves can split and move apart. Allopatric speciation can also occur when individuals colonize a remote area and become geographically isolated from the parent population. So how big does a geographic barrier need to be to keep allopatric populations apart? The answer depends on the, on the ability of the organisms to move. So birds, mountain lions, coyotes, those guys can easily cross mountain ranges. But in contrast, small rodents can find a canyon or a wide river a really formidable barrier. The Grand Canyon and Colorado River separates two species of antelope squirrels. How do reproductive barriers arise? Well, the environment of an isolated population can include different food sources, different kinds of pollinators, and different predators. As a result of natural selection acting on these pre existing variations, or as a result of genetic drift or mutation, a population's traits can change in ways that also establish reproductive barriers. Isolated island chains are often inhabited by unique collections of species. Islands that have diverse habitats and are far enough apart to keep populations keep those populations apart to evolve in isolation, but close enough to allow occasional dispersions to occur are often the sites of multiple speciation events. The evolution of many diverse species from a common ancestor is known as adaptive radiation. The Galapagos Islands is about 900 kilometers west of Ecuador. It's one of the world's greatest showcases of adaptive radiation was formed from underwater volcanoes from 5 million to 1 million years ago and was colonized gradually from other islands and the South America mainland and has many species of plants and animals found nowhere else in the world. The islands currently have 14 species of closely related finches called Darwin's finches because Darwin collected them during his around the world voyage on the Beagle. These birds share many finch-like traits, but they differ in their feeding habits and their beaks. The beaks are specialized for what they eat and arose through adaptive radiation. There are two models for the tempo of speciation. The punctuated equilibrium model will draw on the fossil record where species change most as they arise from an ancestral species and then change very little for the rest of their existence. Or other species appear to have evolved more gradually. The time interval between speciation events varies from a few thousand years to tens of millions of years. This concludes chapter 14. We'll pick up again in chapter 15.